I, I wanted to start by saying that it's always interesting to me to talk to an international audience as an American, in particular because if I were to talk to an American audience, I would not really be able to say some of the things that I would like to say. Um, for example, I'd have to spend 30 minutes talking about oppression, usually, because Americans in general, when we talk about this, um, we need a context setter. And I feel uh, most recently I had the opportunity to meet a guy named Red Ronnie. Some of you in the audience know him. Um, he was part of the struggle against apartheid. And it was really quite an amazing honor to me for him to set the context for me when he heard I was coming to South Africa. And so what he suggested is that I can skip over that context setting. People here understand the concept of struggle, they understand the concept of domination, and they get, generally speaking, he suggested, that if you have a world pyramid of power, that South Africa is not at the top of that pyramid. Would anyone disagree with that? I mean, to be a little controversial here, when we talk about surveillance, um, we can talk about surveillance and pyramids in a particular way. The NSA is on top. You guys will never be on top. You will never be the NSA. You will never have an NSA. So when you choose a world of surveillance, you always choose to be under the boot of the NSA. So when you choose surveillance, you always choose to be the loser. And he was saying, you know, you don't really have to go into too much detail about that. If you just say something like that, they'll get it. If we talked about this in an American context, I think it would be different because people believe, for example, that the state will never target them. They believe that the only victims will be people that they consider to be subhuman, um, which, you know, terrorists, for example. And by that, it's just coded racism for Muslims, usually. But in seriousness, this is something which I'm glad I don't have to talk about too much because in, in the US context, it would be a little bit strange and a little bit hard. And to that point, I, I have a sort of weird self-intro. Um, so I work on the Tor project, um, which is an anonymity network, which I think most of you in this room should use if you need privacy. If you're using things like a single hop VPN to do something you know, in a so-called anonymous way on the internet, you should probably stop. Um, that's, a really bad, that's a really bad plan, especially if you're using uh, a VPN provider that is commercially available, if it's in the United States or elsewhere. You guys are all fair targets. Right? The legal protections basically say you don't, you're not people for the NSA's surveillance programs. And you know, I, I actually really disagree with that. And on behalf of all of the Americans that are pretty unhappy about that, I'm really sorry. But that also is the reality of the situation. Um, when you are using certain VPNs, the NSA has special traffic flow analysis software, for example, that will mark you, put it into a database. And later, when an analyst wants to compromise you, they can just pull up out of this database information about you that's automatically cross-correlated with other information about you, uh, potentially usernames and passwords, as he was saying earlier, but actually lots of more interesting stuff like that, like full content of your internet communications. Um, and the reason I know this is because I work as a freelance investigative journalist. Uh, I broke the story last year about Chancellor Merkel in Germany being spied on by the NSA. I recently just won uh, uh, basically the Pulitzer Prize of Germany for that. Um, but yeah, that's a subject of some controversy because he was a propagandist uh, during the Second World War for, um, let's say, the shittiest people to ever live. Um, so, I mean, I'm both honored by the, the jury for having chosen me, but also totally ashamed to have a, uh, you know, like a fascist, uh, racist propagandist next to my name in the press in Germany now. Uh, and I wrote about that in public, and now everyone has been uh, really unhappy with me for being ungrateful. But, you know, the Holocaust, right? So, um, yeah. Anyway, Julian and Assange and I wrote a book together uh, called Cypherpunks uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and it kind of, in a sense, we wrote it and everyone in the room, every room we talked in, they all sort of mocked us like, oh, you're so paranoid. There's no planetary dragnet surveillance systems. It's totally crazy that governments are attacking people. It's crazy that they want to control people. They want to like, you know, look at how people are traveling around the world. That's just, you're just paranoid. And it's really the worst kind of... Uh, uh, sort of uh, positive feeling. If you, can, if you can feel vindicated by a thing, the worst kind of vindication is to find out you're right about this. Um, and we did. If you read the book, we kind of talk about why these things are happening, how they're happening, and that they are happening a couple of years, basically, before Edward Snowden's uh, releases. And that, that, to me, says something about the analysis. I mean, a lot of these things that we've seen with Snowden are not actually news in the sense that we couldn't have imagined them happening. It's that previously, people could deny them. 
in polite company with a straight face. And now it's kind of unreasonable to deny that. The question is just merely when the government speaks, how much are they lying? Not that they are lying. And that, I mean, that's clear. Like, for example, when Putin was asked by Snowden about whether or not the country collects information on millions of individual people, whether or not that this is a reasonable thing, even though it can be justified for law enforcement and intelligence purposes, everyone, of course, was really angry. How dare he ask this of Putin? Well, the same question was asked of James Clapper, the director of national intelligence. And the reason to ask these questions is not because we don't know the answer. It's because we know the answer, and we want them to show that they are liars. And they are. And they repeatedly lie. Putin lied, and Clapper lied. Clapper lied under oath to Congress. He should be in prison. He's not in prison. Instead, I live in exile in Germany, and he walks freely, even though he has wiretapped the entire planet. Every single one of you, probably, at some point. And especially the Americans in the room. He should definitely be in prison for that, because that's the one thing he was not supposed to do, for sure, under the law. And he did that anyway. Um, so in any case, it's a little bit about me. It's a complicated situation. And uh, I really think that, if it's possible, um, we could talk a little bit about this concept, which is pervasive monitoring. And I hate slides, and they made me make slides for this. And I respect that they really wanted slides. But I'm, I'm going to just talk, because I actually think that slides make your brain turn off. And um, yeah, I want you to think about these problems from a South African perspective. And I want you to come up and talk with me about it afterwards so that I can understand your context. But basically, uh, RFC 7258 talks about the idea of pervasive monitoring uh, as an attack. That the idea is that when we design core internet protocols, for example, we want to we wanna comply with these protocols. We, we want security and privacy. We want confidentiality. We want information assurance. We want different properties from these protocols. And pervasive monitoring is part of a whole bunch of problems that we, we, that we see in protocols, where, for example, we have what's called a distinguisher or a selector. Now, what that allows for a network flow is it allows identification. And with identification, it allows for selective targeting. And targeting is not necessarily a bad thing, but what it suggests is that when you leave these kinds of distinguishers or selectors in the protocols, you're not really thinking about the concept of pervasive monitoring. And that's often the first step for doing other targeted attacks. So, you know, there are a couple of systems that exist in the world, but one of my favorite systems that the NSA has that has been revealed so far is a program called Turmoil. Now, um, how, how many people here have heard about this distinction between PRISM and the Upstream programs? Has anyone here heard about PRISM? I would assume some of you. I hear South African audiences are not very interactive. So, you know, I, I'm a little sad about that. If you can't be bothered to raise your hand, you know, I flew 18 hours to see you raise your hand. Come on. Jesus fucking Christ. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's more like it. Okay, great. So basically the deal is this. You have two main ways to attack a system. You do it by attacking the provider, or you do it by sniffing it off the wire. Now, pervasive monitoring is the thing that we could talk about as sniffing it off the wire, but it includes other things as well. It does include some of the PRISM stuff. But Turmoil is a deep packet inspection system for tapping fiber and for tapping other communications. There's a whole bunch of systems, actually, that, that blend in together as one. Um, we'll just call that DPI, deep packet inspection. But there are all these programs. And Turmoil is one of my favorite, though my absolute favorite is a program called X-Keyscore. And what X-Keyscore is is it's a rolling internet buffer at somewhere between 150 plus, and probably several hundred nodes around the world. And these nodes are at important fiber interconnection points. These nodes then farm back data that they collect to processing hubs, of which there are several. And those processing hubs then do further analysis. In some cases, it's automatic. Like, so um, let's say like a contentious member of the ANC gets on an airplane. This system automatically sees that an airplane reservation goes by, and it tips off another system, which then alerts an analyst in real time, as an example. That happens as part of the X key score system. Now, you might think, like, that's great, right? Like, maybe you don't like the ANC. Fine. Interesting point, right? However, an interesting point about this is that it means that we engineer, in some cases, subtly, our internet protocols to ensure that this capability stays, which means that someone else can build exactly the same thing, but for a different set of people. That is to say, we are intentionally weakening our internet protocols because it is useful for some people, 
without acknowledging the role that it's actually useful for a lot of different players in the game. And if any of you grew up watching war games as I did, you know that the only winning move is not to play. And we're not, we're not taking that. Instead, we're really engaging in this game. And in this game, what the NSA does with X-Keyscore is that they actually have a programmatic interface to looking at these rolling internet buffers. And so these buffers, if you imagine a planet, right, our planet, you have what are called foreign sats, so satellite communication systems, and those beam information back down to Earth. Those uh, satellite beams, they're picked up, they're searched through in real time. Information that's interesting is automatically selected, and depending on what it is, if it's metadata, it goes into a metadata database. If it is content, it is often also put into a content database. So this is sort of the difference between the programs Marina and Pinwheel, or Pinwall, depending on which age the analyst is when you ask about it. And um, this essentially is pervasive monitoring where they don't have to read it in real time. In some cases, the selectors, they, they actually trip and an action does take place in real time, like, hey, the guy you want to kill with the drone, he's right here. And then they pass that information off to the CIA and the CIA kills the person with an extrajudicial assassination. So that does happen in real time, but the more likely thing, even though that happens to thousands and thousands of people, the more likely thing is that the information is put into a really large database. And that database is a whole bunch of databases, actually. In some cases, you have a real-time full content buffer of the entire internet. So in the case of Tempora around the United Kingdom, they have something like 72 hours to a week of buffer time, though I'm not completely sure about what their current capacity is. But that means every byte that flows in and out of the United Kingdom is in that buffer. Every byte. It's not metadata and content separated. You know, don't think about it like that. But with X-Keyscore, the, the metadata is actually 30 days or more, and the content depends on the power, storage, and cooling capacity of that system, whichever system it is. Now, for Tempora, that's an extreme version, and that's because the GCHQ is even more lawless than the NSA, actually, which makes sense. They're a monarchy, actually a theocracy, um, so I kind of expect worse from them, actually. And I'm glad to see that the U.S. is not the biggest asshole on the planet, for once, right? I mean, it's always, it's always nice when there's a bigger asshole, and uh, that's the British uh, Secret Services. So um, just in case there's any doubt about that, um, they really, like, the gloves are totally off. You know, they don't have a constitution in the sense that the U.S. has a constitution. And there's a reason we shot the British. It's too bad that we teamed up with them uh, to exploit that, because part of the idea of a constitutional republic is that you, you, you don't do that kind of stuff and that you believe in individualized, particularized suspicion. Now, if you're thinking about this buffer, you realize that they're completely incompatible, right? And the courts in Luxembourg has actually ruled that this dragnet surveillance systems, this kind of data retention, these things are incompatible with the rule of law. They're incompatible with the notion of particularized suspicion, in fact. And so these buffers, they do something with those buffers in real time. Now, you can write in a, um, a programming language, um, which is called Genesis. I don't think anyone's ever mentioned that in public before. Um, am I right about that, Charlie? Is it Genesis? You, you can't... <laughs> yeah, okay. Different time, different time. But, uh, you know, um, I should say, not all of the NSA guys are bad guys. In fact, most of the workers, like Charlie, they're good. You can tell. He left. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, you know, it's an important distinction, right? I mean, the, this whole black hat, white hat thing, I think, is really simplistic. We shouldn't, we shouldn't think about it like that. Um, we should think about it in terms of power and control. We should think about it in terms of economics. And we should think about the results. So there are connected issues. When we talk about programming in the language of Genesis, in order to uh, look over this traffic, I mean, it tells you a lot about their mindset, right? It tells you that they have, like, a holy biblical lineage in their mind, for example. That's a really interesting thing. I mean, you learn a lot about the mindset of people. They really believe they're doing God's work. And in fact, that is kind of what they think, in the sense that they are trying to be pervasive. They're trying to be all seeing, all knowing, all doing, and then all acting. They want to be able to do something useful. So when you write in this programming language, the purpose of it is to build selectors for tagging flows of traffic, for example. So XKeyScore allows you to have these metadata tags attached to traffic flows, which then go into a complicated processing system. And depending on what the processing system is that it gets shunted off to, it may be full collection of the traffic flow. It may be you are a target. So for example, I've been told that I'm what is called cast iron. And cast iron means total 100% monitoring of everything that I do. 
Every traffic flow I ever touch with any unique identifier that's ever tied to me is recorded for all time, with no exception, forever. No five-year data retention, 10-year data retention, forever. So what do you do in a situation like that, right? I mean, other than live in Germany in exile, right? <laughs> so, you know, that I guess what you do is you have to deconstruct that system, and not just for yourself, but for everyone, because it won't happen in isolation. It only happens when everyone works together to work towards a solution, actually. So I take a lot of, I take a lot of my interest in this topic from looking at revolutionary struggles throughout the last 150 years and before, because what I realized is that when we talk about not being able to defeat the NSA, that's the wrong discussion. What we have to talk about is building a world where there is actually equality on the network, right? Where the digital proletariat has to control the means of reproduction, not just production. We have to be able to securely communicate, to be able to communicate in a way where we have integrity and confidentiality in our communications, where we don't rely on someone else to give us the liberty that we actually have until we give it up on the network. And, and that is a really strange way, a strange frame of looking at it, but that's actually how I do look at it. I think about it in terms of a collective struggle. Because the problem is not the NSA. The problem is that those capabilities exist at all. So that huge internet buffer we're talking about, everybody's VPN falls over with that. Not just because a lot of the crypto is bad, and it is bad in some cases, and it's not just because NSA and RSA get together and backdoor their cryptographic standards, though it is also that. It's because most of the protocols of the internet don't take into account this RFC because it wasn't written until about a month ago. So most of the standards that are on the planet just don't deal with this reality. And that's a, that's a really, quite frankly, it's a really scary reality. And that's just the passive monitoring capabilities. And as the nice gentleman from SensePost was saying earlier, there's also this thing called turbine. Now, he was actually referring to my reporting in Der Spiegel where we talked about um, turmoil, turbine, and the turbulence architecture, a little bit of X-key score. Um, and at the, the KS Communications Congress, I gave a talk which I would really recommend that you all watch. It's significantly better than the talk I'm giving right now in technical detail. It is an hour-long review of every single technical thing that I could get into one hour about the NSA, about hardware backdoors, software implants, the stuff that they're calling bad BIOS, which, you know, there's like, to call it bad BIOS is a, an understatement. You know, they have attack tool kits that allow you to weaponize and do crazy stuff for everything from hard drive firmware to the BIOS in a computer, uh, you know, to like anything you can imagine, including stealing your mail and then adding a chip and then repackaging it and mailing it onward, right? So if you buy, for example, Cisco gear in the United States and ship it to South Africa, <laughs> oh boy, this is a big fucking mistake. <laughs> Right? And, and so I'll, I'll kind of explain um, two of my favorite cases of this. Um, cases where it is not legitimate to say that these people are legitimate targets. Um, so could, I, I, I know you all hate to participate, but could you raise your hand if you work at an ISP or you provide services to someone about communication? Anybody? Okay, so now raise your hand if you're an American citizen when you're doing that. Anybody? Okay, great. Now we've settled it. We don't have to talk too much about, uh, about legal restrictions. You are a legitimate target. You're not just a legitimate target. You probably, if you do an interesting job and you have interesting customers, you probably are already owned. Because the NSA is pretty good, but it's also because you're awful at what you do, almost certainly, compared to what the NSA has as capabilities. For example, Belgacom has millions and millions of dollars to spend on security and they were completely compromised inside and out, but not because they're Al-Qaeda, but because speculatively some interesting people may be using their services or were using their services. And so the GCHQ and the NSA teamed up together and just compromised them completely. Backdoored the routers, uh, backdoored like everything you can imagine, had access to basically the entire Belgacom network, and I've heard that they're actually still in today that they have pieces of hardware that they can't replace, that they're locked out of because of service contracts. I don't know if that's public, but who cares? You should know about it. It's a really serious problem. And that is because it, those people were useful, because the law does not constrain them, and because Belgacom is in Belgium, they feel like they can get away with it. They don't do any weighing about whether or not it's a good idea to do this kind of stuff. And so they just totally compromised them. And they deployed the full suite of software-based implants 
and they used all the databases that I mentioned, and they used the Tempora program, and they went after people. So for example, they used a system called Quantum, Quantum Insert, and Quantum is not really one program, it's many programs. So you have like Quantum Hand, Quantum uh, Cookie, you have all these different Quantum Suite attacks. And basically they're man on the side injection attacks where you have the passive sensor network around the world. And when it sees something that's interesting, it tips off another system, which is the turbine system, and that injects information, or I should say it tips off a series of systems. Maybe it has to do with the implants that turbine is controlling, but it tips off some systems, and packets are injected into the network to respond. Now, you can catch this on the wire if you have packet capture on your own networks. You can see it in the form of two packets coming to your network at the same time, where one is the legitimate response from a server that you're visiting, like let's say LinkedIn's web page, and the other one is a different uh, packet that has a different payload potentially, um, where it's a single packet, usually, as I understand it. It gets injected, it beats it because it's faster than the response from LinkedIn because they tip a sensor network that is somewhere else. Um, that is, the injection can happen very close to your browser. So if you're in South Africa and you go to LinkedIn, and let's say the, the packet would travel all the way to the United States and back, they're always going to be able to beat that if they can do injection in South Africa, right? It's like a CDN, but uh, it's a pwn DN, you know, right? It's a pwning distributed network. They're basically able to just reflect packets off of other routers as well. So they have, like, when they implant systems, they can actually use those systems to do injection onto the network. They don't just have the ability to exfiltrate data, they can actually also use it to send data. Um, so in doing that, they then um, forge the identity of an American company, usually, because they like to uh, make America look bad, and, and all American companies look worse, and so they inject these fake pages, and then they have, for example, a way to audit the browser, and then they do automated audits, then they inject a thing which for a long time, it was called Validator, and then it was called Common Deer, like spelled like common and a deer, like a deer in headlights, because um, they're funny guys. I mean, they, they have a good sense of humor. Um, and I'm sure that it's something else now. They also had a thing that are called Smoths or Season Moths. Now, if you've, ever, <laughs> if you've ever read any Philip K. Dick, I feel like these guys must have read a lot of Philip K. Dick and said like, wow, this is incredible. I want to build this world. And then they did, actually, not this world, right? So Philip K. Dick is the guy that wrote A Scanner Darkly. He wrote Man in a High Castle. Uh, he wrote a whole bunch of really great science fiction books about a dystopian world or a series of dystopians, dystopian worlds. Um, probably uh, some of you know uh, some of the movies like The Adjusters or The Adjustment Bureau and, and other movies are like Total Recall. These are Philip K. Dick horror stories. Um, but you'll also notice that he was like very prescient in, in sort of telling us what the world would look like. And it's, I think because these guys grew up reading and watching these films, and so they were like, well, what do we do? Let's make that world. And so <laughs> it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so some of the names of the implants, I think, may even be inspired by Philip K. Dick, though I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I, my heart is there with them, but uh, not in action, let's say. Um, so they did this to Belgacom with LinkedIn, and they owned them that way. So if you have LinkedIn and you log into it, there's a really good chance you used a web browser to do it, and that's it, you're done. They've got your machine. And probably, once they're on your network, they get all the machines nearby. And that is pretty much it. it doesn't, it's not even that complicated, but all the infrastructure they have that allows them to figure out that LinkedIn is the vector that is useful is the scary part, right? The fact that they do a, an inject, a packet injection attack anywhere on the internet for you is like, kind of cool, but it's not actually as interesting as the all-seeing eye that says that LinkedIn is the thing that will work. Because that's the other part, which is the analysis part, where they have analysts that do analysis, but they also have machines that do analysis. So they have automatic audits. When people are browsing the web, they can actually see that you're using a vulnerable version of Safari, and that if they want to task you with quantum, which is uh, what they probably have done to several people in this room, myself included, I'm sure, um, they Really, it's as simple as saying, this person is the target, we'd like to task them. And they look for all the identifiers, and then they look for this uh, traffic flowing across the wire, and they can automatically audit software based on the traffic that they see. And then from that, they know which payloads will be useful for exploiting you. And then once they have actually put this first stage payload, or stage zero payload, 
commandeer, validator, seasoned moth, or whatever, they can have different uh, payloads that go after that. So one of the things that they do on a Windows machine, for example, is they look through the process list, and they actually do look to see if you have antivirus. And depending on which kind of antivirus you might have, they actually do stop the operation and drop to an interactive session with an operator who's standing by so that there's like a real military operation that's taking place. And I've met a couple of those guys, and they really believe in the holiness of their mission. So they're like pretty gung-ho about it. And it's interesting when, when you, if you ever get the chance to talk to someone about this, is because for like the real bad guys, you, you know, you can kind of imagine that you're with them, right? Like they're going to go get the Osama bin Ladens of the world, and it's kind of hard to fault them for that. And I really don't actually fault them for that. But they built this whole system predicated on the idea that they were going to only use it for the Osama bin Ladens of the world. And then they realized they had this system which was really useful for using on everybody else. And the thing that I have found in doing research is that the Osama bin Ladens are the exception to who they compromise. They basically never compromise people like that compared to the total scale. Because the total number of terrorists in the world is pretty low compared to the total number of systems and computers that they've owned. And Belgacom and the satellite providers in Germany, I think, are a great evidence of that, which is they owned lots of computers in each of these different cases. Now, the satellite providers in Germany, they also wanted to have uh, the ability to do wiretaps inside of the satellite network. They already are sniffing the downlinks, but in some cases, the downlinks are encrypted. So what do you do? Well, you go to the place that has the keys. And so in order to get one person, they have this, what we could call collateral damage, though I don't want to call it that, because it's intentional. It is intentional damage. It is not an accident that this is happening. It's on purpose. And so they, they did this to the satellite providers as well, and Der Spiegel covered this uh, in detail. And you can read about it online, and I think it's, yeah, I think it's basically worth reading about it uh, in detail. And I won't go too much into it, except to say that their systems were totally compromised. I mean, they got everything. And the way they got it is that they actually mostly already had what they needed from their sensors. And then they could automatically task and extract stuff. So um, I know you don't like interaction, but does anybody here feel like they would withstand these kinds of, these kinds of attacks? It's good. I, I asked it that way so that no one would raise their hand. <laughs> I learned, right? Um, so so this, is, this is basically the core, right? It's DPI, DPI, right? It's deep packet inspection, deep packet injection. And, and I actually think that, so there is another system, which I, I don't know if we release it, but we'll release it now, or talk about it now. Um, it's called uh, tutelage. And the idea is that you use turmoil, turbine, um, uh, turbulence, the whole turbulence architecture together, and then you put that around the uh, so-called defense industrial base. So the Lockheed Martins of the world get a special privilege. They get a special military protection. And the Germans have a word for this, and they know it quite well. And it's, uh, I'm really bad at pronouncing it, but it's Gleichschaltung, or Gleichschaltung. It means synchronization between private companies and the state. Uh, the Italians have a different word for it. They call it fascism. And I think it's an important word to understand because whether or not you think it is a good idea for the military to protect your networks, that's a discussion with historical precedent. And we should consider the historical precedent, which is to say that these companies think that they're getting something useful, and they probably are getting something useful. But they are also getting other things, like a chain of command that doesn't include them, with considerations that may not be what they would like, with insurance that maybe doesn't hold up, and maybe assurances that aren't true. So as an example of this, um, you make a promise to your customer when you, when you have this kind of defense industrial base tutelage system monitoring you, and you actually can't keep those promises because it's not just you that's involved in that. It's actually also some of the people that do this spying. So when Google and the NSA team up to defend themselves, did they become part of the defense industrial base in the tutelage system? I don't know. I haven't seen any documents that say yes, but what kind of protection is the NSA offering if not this kind of protection? My guess is, other than hardening guides and getting people from the NSA to swing into Google's security department, which definitely happens, um, probably they're doing something like this. Um, so I, I kind of want to transition a little bit away from talking about stuff like Bull Run and uh, like full content collection or uh, full metadata collection like what we just learned about is happening in Kenya um, to something positive. Um, mostly because I think there's no, almost no positive, so it's a really easy wrap up. And, uh, <laughs> sorry to say. Um, but that, that uh, yeah, that basically sums it up. This slide is basically the best we've got. And that's really sad. I mean, it really actually could not, 
Could not be worse. It, it's cut off there, but it says one of the few things that constrains systems of violence is M. It's a, the, the word is math. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit on the slide for some reason. But um, basically the deal is this. If you buy proprietary software from RSA, you are probably going to buy something that has an NSA backdoor. And whether or not RSA knows is a great question. You know, I'm sure that they have the same problem that when they produce the mints out there. We, we have a nickname for the RSA mints. They're called the Judas mints. It tastes like treachery. And, uh, and uh, if, you, if you buy a software product from them, they might not know when they were advised that they were misadvised. And this is actually a failure of governance and trust in the United States. And I feel pretty unhappy about this fact. Um, but the reality of the situation is that, you know, when you have free software, it does not mean that you don't have the same problem. It does not mean that Charlie can't, like, you know, audit it and find a bug. Quite the opposite. There are probably lots of bugs, and there are almost certainly tons of bug doors as well. But the difference is that you have a starting point for your own work where you can actually begin to verify, right? There's a famous quote from the 80s about atomic weapons, right? Trust but verify. Well, we need to go further than that. We need to have trust but verify, and then we need to have the ability to take that thing and make it our own. We, we have to have that, and we would call that autonomy, generally speaking. And if we don't have that kind of autonomy, we have a really serious problem, which is we have dependence. And dependence creates a power relationship, which is not one that we want. We want independence, actually, not dependence. So free software can help with that, but that's because free software is about freedom. It gives you the right to study the code, to modify the code, to share the modifications with other people. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the software is without cost, but it means that the intentional goal of free software is liberty. Right? So we also talk about this in terms of open source, but it's not just about source code. It actually matters when you, when you look at software. So one of the things that I've found, um, which is good news, is that the NSA, when they do intercepts on people and they see off-the-record messaging messages from people's Jabber chats and from ambulance messaging and other protocols, um, they say, sorry, can't decrypt this. It's off the record. That's great. It means this thesis that math actually constrains these systems, these systems which include systems of violence and promote systems of violence, that mathematics actually stops them. It means that we can use cryptography to protect ourselves. And part of what we'll need to be able to do is to have free software systems where we can audit them and to know that the math is correct and the implementations are correct. And basically, when you look at vendors that are selling these solutions, uh, like everybody's selling a solution outside, sorry guys, uh, but not too sorry, you have a problem, which is even if they're the best people in the world, if they don't have a process by which you are verifying what they're giving you, you might get something that's extra added by someone that happens all the time, actually, in devices. And you might also find that someone working inside of their company did not behave the way that they were supposed to, or they behaved exactly as they're supposed to behave. It's just that they have a different master than the people that they thought should be giving them direction. So free software helps us with this, but it also helps us to blend in, which is another important point, which is you want to have when you're installing software, you want to make it as hard as possible for someone to distinguish you on the network. You want to make it as hard as possible for someone to be able to target you. And that's one of the nice things about free software is you can just pass it around, actually. And you can verify that what you get is the same as what your neighbor gets. But you still have tons of problems because we barely know how to program computers in a way that is secure or to build systems that are secure. So free software is not the only thing. But we also need what we could call free and open hardware. And just recently, there was a big Kickstarter by Bunny, who created the Chumbi and a bunch of other really amazing stuff. He hacked the, X, uh, the Xbox. And he created a thing called the Novena. And the idea is to begin to have a free and open hardware platform where we know what's inside and where you can take the designs and fab them in South Africa. So you don't have the problem of physical interdiction. Right? So the NSA really does steal mail from people. When you buy a Cisco router, there's a picture in Glenn Greenwald's book of them doing this to a Cisco router. You buy this hardware, and they either implant software or hardware in the shipping process. Well, one way to take that entire attack service away is to control the means of production. And I'm sorry to reinvent Marx for the digital era, uh, or to plagiarize him, as it were, but it's very important to understand this. If you can make this here, you can shift the, the attacks to somewhere else. That is really powerful. And so what the Novena allows you to do, if you have fabrication facilities, is to begin to do that. 
Now, it has a Freescale IMX6 processor in it, so you still have this problem, which is that you are beholden to Freescale, not having all of these issues, and to those CPUs not getting backdoored. But that's significantly better than entire computer systems, potentially. And it's just a start. There's a guy who built a thing that's called the Milky Mist. Uh, he goes by the name of Le Canal, and he's a really great hardware person who replaced the CPU with an FPGA. So you can actually compile your own CPU, well, it's technically you're synthesizing it in the FPGA, FPGA language, and then you load the bitstream into the FPGA, and now you can boot, for example, Linux on an FPGA, where you can audit the CPU. You can know there aren't special instructions. And you can also verify the FPGA um, in some ways that might be harder to do with the CPU, that are significantly harder, because CPUs are all proprietary, and even if you shave it down and you look at every layer, you won't know, for example, if you have this like latent doping problem, uh, as an example, which is super hard to detect. In fact, basically not possible. Um, so this open hardware, though, really can help quite a lot. But fundamentally, the key thing that is going to help us until we have sci-fi computers, uh, that is quantum computing, is cryptography. And even with quantum computing, there exists a thing called post-quantum cryptography, mostly by Dan Bernstein and Tanya Long, who have been working on this under that, under that name. Um, but it is really cryptography that helps us here. So for example, in some of the NSA implants where they talk about backdooring hard drive firmware, um, that they say, uh, for example, Samsung, uh, I think Maxter, and a bunch of other hard drive companies they're like, they've got that firmware, they can just implant it. And then when you boot your machine, you boot your computer, one of your servers, you know, the, the firmware does something nasty to take over the machine, regardless of what operating system is running. But they didn't mention Intel, which is interesting. And it seems that Intel may sign their firmware so that you can't just update the firmware with anything. Now, that would almost sound incompatible with free software, but the question is who controls the keys? Right? And so what we need to know is that cryptography can protect us. And if you have free software and you could load your own firmware, what matters is that you're actually authorized to load that. And right now we exist in a total wild west where all these chips can be reprogrammed. But it does seem to indicate to me that cryptography does stop them with that particular vector. And it seems to stop them everywhere else. So for example, the Tor browser, I work on the Tor project, so there's a little bit of shilling here for myself. But what I've seen in this evidence is that the Tor browser stops them from doing passive monitoring, and they have to switch to targeting. And that's good. We want them to go from bulk or mass surveillance to targeted stuff. Now, the targeted stuff is not, because it's automated, it's not less in scale. It's just different in methodology, actually. Uh, and usually, they work together. Off-the-record messaging, it's much the same. I've seen, this, I've seen concrete proof that when they have intercepted a message with OTR, they can't decrypt it. And they even have the cryptographic exploitation solutions people say, Sorry, can't do anything, it's off the record. And that's in contrast to lots of other stuff, actually. So, I, I mean, I feel pretty good about those things, and I use those things to protect myself. The Tor browser could be much better with sandboxing and things like that, and not based on Firefox, for example. We only have so much time in the day. So, I mean, we can't really resist a lot of the targeted attacks, but I think in terms of passive surveillance, cryptography helps us. And to that end, Redphone, which is cut off on the slide, is really probably one of the best things. So if you have an Android phone, and soon I think on iOS, but it'll be called Signal, maybe? I'm not, I'm not sure what, what, if it's even out. I don't have an iOS device. But um, this allows you to make end-to-end -end forward secret encrypted calls, where even if after the fact someone decides you're interesting and they break into your phone, the keys are destroyed at the end of the call. So there's nothing to steal. Now, if the device is already compromised when you make a call, obviously all bets are off. But the fact that this is now a part of you know, everyday app installs on a phone, that's really great. We're changing the paradigm away from surveillance. And TechSecure now being included in CyanogenMod, it's a derivative of the OTR protocol. And TechSecure and Redphone are by probably like the great, one of the great living cypherpunks, Moxie Marlinspike. And those, those two tools really help with the issue of, of pervasive monitoring of content. They don't really help with metadata protection. So it's not that you won't be found or targeted later. Um, but all three uh, or four of these things together, we start to, to see a, a different picture emerge. As we start to bake anonymity and cryptography into systems together, it makes it harder for someone to do pervasive monitoring. It makes it harder for them to exploit the protocols as they're, they're traveling across the wire. It makes it hard just in general for data that's collected to be worthwhile. And that changes the economic situation. And changing the economic situation is part of how we change the, the social system. 
And the legal reforms that are necessary here, um, one of them, which is quite controversial, is essentially the idea that we need to have, these are, uh, these are really, con what I'm about to say is very controversial in the legal world, um, but it makes sense if you follow so far, I think, which is if we have a regime of spying where some people spy some of the time legally, we have a problem, which is that someone else who is not in your legal regime is spying all of the time. Now, you choose so-called lawful interception in South Africa, and it exists. I had, when I met Red Ronnie, I actually, the big conflict we had is his, he, was in the, he was the head of the intelligence services. You know, what I told him is that he didn't really want to deconstruct the power. And I said, you, you wanted to control the power. I want to see you deconstruct that power, because it can't, you know, if you want to use a Lord of the Rings analogy, you know, you want to wield the wing because you believe you are the ring because you'll be benevolent, and I want to melt it down because I don't believe that there's such a thing as human benevolence when you have such a ring. It turns out the NSA basically proves this. With their Samuel Get and Mystic surveillance systems where they're intercepting 100% of the communications of Bahamas, all of the content, all of the metadata, they've proved it. The Bahamas chose so-called lawful interception, and in the end, they got completely illegal total surveillance of the entire island for all content of their communications. So when you choose that, you lose, always. So the legal reform I want to see is that we have mandatory forward secret encryption, where we get rid of wiretapping. And when you want to monitor someone, you let them know that it is happening, so that they can have some kind of legal recourse to go to a judge and say, why are you spying on me? And we can do this with cryptography because, in fact, Redphone, it gives you some fingerprint data that shows you're talking to who you think you are. And when the fingerprint doesn't match, you know someone is intercepting. That gives you the ability to have legal recourse. It doesn't mean wiretapping stops. It means secret wiretapping stops. And it also means that it can be detected. And it also means that it won't happen with an outside party without a very high cost of detection. Now, it will take 50 years, probably, to get to the point that I'm saying right now, but that if you're not a utopianist, you're a schmuck. So I really think we should try to get there. And in particular, we should get there not just for special people, but for every person. And as an example of a particular kind of betrayal by the NSA, they give up full content collection to the Israelis. And they say, please remove senators and congresspeople and interesting folks from the data set we give you. Do you suppose the Israelis do that when they get our signals intelligence data? And anyone? Does anyone believe that they do that? Charlie? No comment from the NSA or the ex-NSA. All right. So I think that's part of the problem, is that there is no honor among thieves, and these guys are thieves. Right? So what we have to do is we have to make sure that the thieves can't be thieves anymore. We have to change the economic things by changing the mathematical things that are here. And to do that, we need to change the laws. So there's a thing called You Broke the Internet, and it's a legal uh, policy suggestion for the European Union, which you could adopt here as well, that basically specifically talks about the details of how to change the laws to make it so that we're not vulnerable. Because you guys can't build security products or have secure services in the world that we just talked about. You just can't do it. It's not a business-friendly world. It's not a civil liberties-friendly world. And so we really need those legal reforms. And Part of the, uh, you know, the argument against this is the idea that you know, bad guys will change their behavior. And actually, just I don't buy that. I think that it's speculative in that bad guys uh, already have a behavior that is mostly exempt from this. Right? The Zeta cartel goes, they're a very bad drug cartel in Mexico. They actually infiltrate the telephone system uh, companies in Mexico to find people that are tipping off people about drug cartels so they can cut their heads off. They use the so-called le legal interception routines to go after people. They themselves run their own cell phone networks, which are not susceptible to legal intercept. So we trade away a lot of security only to end up with the worst people having it, and we are left in the middle with really lo a lot of vulnerability. And you can't build from that space very well, I think. Um, so that the legal solutions, I think, are very contentious because of the power dynamics involved. But I really would urge people to consider the long view and in the long view, especially in Africa, there's a kind of neo-colonialism that's taking place between the Chinese government and the American government. And they're racing to install as much network equipment as they possibly can across the entire continent. Whichever one wins has, on the internet, colonized that country's communication systems. And we see it with Kenya. Kenya has, as part of the Mystic program, 
100% of the metadata of the telephone systems and probably the internet, but that's probably under a different program, would be my guess. Um, they've got it. Look who installs the networks in Kenya. Look who supports the internet there. Do we suppose that when the Chinese do that somewhere else, uh, in Zimbabwe, for example, I think that there's currently a debate about who will do this. Who has it? And if you look to South Africa, who has helped build those systems? Are they South African telephone switches? Probably not. That would be my guess. So what that means is that this kind of neo-colonialist power can be used against you when you least want it. You don't really have independence from that. And so what I came here to say is that we can do things like write free and open source software, build free and open hardware, we can use strong cryptography, and we can use that to declare our independence. So that's basically all that I have, and I'd like to take questions, so thank you very much. Folks, I just want to say, how, how disappointed I am in many of you. Um, I, I want you to convince Jacob that we are, in fact, a very interactive nation when it comes to this kind of thing. And let me make it easy for you. Um, imagine that this is a rugby match. It's, it's a bull sharks game. He's the referee that has made a bad call, okay? And that's real South African interactivity. So, folks, um, for, <laughs> for, the, for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, I, I would be very happy to entertain questions. I think we're going to run some, some microphones in the audience. Maybe I could start, if you don't mind, um, uh, Jacob. You talk about digital proletarianism, uh, which I thought was a very useful turn of phrase. Um, all very well, um, but do you think that these digital proletariats actually have the will to win this battle that you've so clearly articulated for us? No. Um, so part of the point here, um, and this is especially a problem in the global north, is that white people think that they're not a target. Right? They just think it's Muslims, people of color, and they don't have to worry about it. And they have no solidarity. And it comes from deep-rooted, fucked-up racism in its core. Okay? Now, here in South Africa... Oh, wow. I like, I like that, you, that you agree with that. That's hashtag fucked up racism, huh? Yeah. As opposed to other racism, right? So, but, but an interesting point here is that what that means is that people think they're exempt, right? The most smug jerks I've ever encountered about these programs are white Americans, usually men in their 30s and 40s, who built the systems or who sell information to people to build these systems. And then they're surprised, for example, when their bugs are used to kill people, or they're not surprised, they're proud of it. And then they're surprised that anyone would be opposed to it, actually. Or they say, well, what did you expect? Of course, are you shocked by this? Are you an idiot? But the point is not that I'm supposed to be shocked. The point is that now that we know, we have to do something about it. And I don't think generally people think of themselves as part of being part of the proletariat. Like, for example, ask a Canadian or a British person if they think the queen is relevant. And they'll tell you, oh, no, the queen has no power. But actually, the Queen's representative, the Governor General, in the 21st century prorogued the parliament twice, suspending the democratically elected parliament twice. And in 1975, the Governor General did that in Australia. So the point is not that the power doesn't exist, is that people have a different relationship to the power, where they think of themselves as something else. And so I think a lot of people don't think they're part of the digital proletariat, and so they think, oh, it's not my fight. And that's fine, that's exactly the same fight, but now told again on the internet, as we've experienced it in the past. Now, I'm not, I'm not a Marxist, but I do think, you know, hi historical materialism plays a huge part in this. Because when the network infrastructure is, in fact, controlled by someone who doesn't respect your human rights, you can be damn sure they're going to use it in ways that don't respect your human rights. And that's the basis of historical materialism. The social conditions before suggest what will come next. And that's what we see with the NSA. We see clearly that they exploit whatever they can, because they are able to. So we have to just change those power dynamics. And until we do, I think it'll be a really big problem. All right, just a quick follow-up then. You've been detained, you've had equipment seized, you've had court orders against you. Um, where's the tipping point here? How do you know when you've won your fight, or at least have started to win your fight? Ah, there is no winning. There is only continuous struggle, right? I mean, now I sound like Trotsky. But, uh, but uh, there is only the state of permanent revolution, right? If we can achieve that, that would be useful. But basically the issue here is that even if you have all of the things that I've suggested, an attacker can still attack you. It just changes the way that they attack and that you can detect it. So there is no winning, but we can shift to a place that we can mostly agree is where we should be as opposed to where we are now. 
And so we, we should look at the means to that end, and we should try to create just means, and we should also try to ensure that we understand that there is no end. There is only continuing means. At some point, you just drop off the struggle. Anybody in the audience? Uh, guys, we've got microphones, so let's... Uh, where we're, th this, uh, that guy has a question. Okay, over here first, let's go here. One, and then there was somebody over here. That's the best word, by the way, yeah. in, in South Africa. I love it when people say, here, here, here. Okay. Here so we go. Good. Off you go. So good. And folks, let's try and keep them short so we don't want speeches, just quick, short, sharp questions. Hi. Hi Off you go. Um, you spoke about hardware and software vulnerabilities. I just want to find out, for us to be independent of the current uh, providers, where do we start in terms of security? Hardware and software. Well, I think you... I have to ask yourself if you actually have the capability to do something about hardware. And if you do, then you've got to build hardware at the same time. But look, for example, at your cell phone. A cell phone actually has in it an architecture that to some people here will be really offensive when I describe it. But if you, if you allow me to, what I would say is this. Your phone in front of you has what's called a baseband processor and an application processor. And that sounds really innocuous, right? It sounds like... Ah, you know, it does one thing, it talks to the cell phone tower, the other thing gives me my WhatsApp, right? Well, actually, the thing is that it's a master-slave relationship in the technical diagrams. And the baseband processor loaded with proprietary software is the master of the application processor. And that's how they talk about it. That is all proprietary software that you do not control, that is controlled by someone else, usually the phone carrier, for example. And it is the master of the application software. So even if you have Android, even if it's all free software, you still don't have the liberty that free software is trying to grant you. So what you have to do is look at every bit and make sure that it is what you expect, that it does as you expect it to, that it is essentially free software. And then you have to look at those power dynamics and you have to ask if it works in your favor for every system that exists. So it's the same for power control systems, it's the same for cell phones, it's the same for laptops. And laptops are really just a collection of little computers together that have the same series of problems. So you have to do both at the same time. But if you don't have the means of production for hardware, you should at least start with the software. And if you can, transition away from hardware that clearly empowers someone else. And you can just ask yourself, can I reprogram this device? Do I have the ability to write free software? Is there a specification for the hardware? And when the answer is no, throw it away and move on. Now, that's not actually a practical solution for businesses, obviously. But things like the Novena project that I mentioned, um, they are starting to get down that line where every single bit of software required to run it is free software. And the hardware is mostly open and free with the exception of a proprietary CPU. So I think that's, unfortunately, it's a, it's a long battle. But lots of battles worth fighting take uh, a long, long time, right? So I think this is not a five-year or 10-year struggle. I think it's a 100-year struggle, actually. Uh, in light of what you just said, uh, what would your take be on the anonymous collective? Say that, say that again? In light of what you just said, what yeah. would your take be on the anonymous collective? Uh, on anonymous as a collective? Well, uh, I think it was cool that a lot of NSA people participated in, in anonymous because it showed that not all of them were kind of not so great. Um, but I think that collectives in general always have problems. And I'm not, I mean, I like certain aspects of anonymous, but what is anonymous except uh, the ability to... Uh, you know, essentially just declare it as a flag. So anybody can do it, whatever they want and just attach that to it. And so I obviously agree with some of the things people have attached the anonymous flag to, but many things I don't agree with. And I think it's important to recognize that that's all it is. It's just declaring an alignment. And if we look at what GCHQ has done to people in anonymous, um, that is actually one where I just don't even need to make that distinction. You know, they talk about infiltration, they talk about sending honeypots, they talk about doing all these attacks I talked about and more to people engage in legitimate political activity who, for the most part, are not making a huge difference. They're not actually worth destroying your civil liberties for. Right? People fought for hundreds of years to have civil liberties, and we're just throwing them away because of a few people putting that flag up. And I, yeah, so, I mean, depending on the context, I have, you know, obviously mixed feelings, but when it comes to them being targeted by military intelligence, I think it's very clear that Anonymous is on the right side of history and GCHQ is not. Right, the light's a bit bright on the stage here. Where's the microphone? There's a guy in the... Over there? There's, there's one over there. Yeah. Whoever's got the mic. I've got the mic, yeah. Uh, Jacob, thanks for the talk. I um, can't, can't even see you. Uh, I'm blinding right. light. You're at the back. Hi. So you spoke about uh, autonomy and independence 
um, from a technical perspective. Sort of as knowledge of this reaches the political ranks, it seems as though uh, some con uh, countries are disconnecting themselves. What do you think the chances are that the internet winds up balkanized? Well, um, I had a, a very good friend who lived in Argentina and he worked at Core Security for a long time. He's one of the main people that started Core. Um, you know them probably because they make Core Impact, which was sort of like Metasploit for the 90s. Um, and he moved to China because he thought it was an interesting place to live and he wanted to study Mandarin and he wanted to work like meeting Chinese hackers and see what the world was like in their eyes. And I said, you know, but the China is breaking up the internet. And he, he moved there at a time in which, you know, the Great Firewall of China was still like suspicious, but we didn't really know any details about it. Um, and really it's just like a crappy version of quantum copper or quantum bot, which is what the NSA has for the whole planet. China has it for their, the boundaries of their nation. And he said, you know, there isn't one internet. There are lots of little broken internets. And he said that about five years ago. And I think he's right. And the reality is every network you're on will have to make a declaration. And it will have to declare that it wants you to have the ability to freely communicate or not. It wants to have a unified threat modeling device on the network that spies on you, or it doesn't. And you have to decide which networks you want to be a part of. And it won't be as simple as the good countries and the bad countries. Because in Egypt during the revolution, you know, the internet still functioned for their spy service, right? They were using Tor, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. And I think that that is, uh, it's the case that these things happen simultaneously. So it won't be that the internet is balkanized. The internet is already balkanized. It will be that we may be able to detect and deal with the balkanization in a useful way in the future if we choose to. And that is what I think we should choose to do. That's part of declaring independence, is deciding that you're not going to go along with the fragmentation or the sabotage, and that you're going to choose a different path. And so I, I hope that answers your question. I can't see you, but I hope you're shaking your head yes. OK, in the interest of fairness and egalitarianism, anybody on the left wing of the audience here that would like to ask a question? Off you go. And then let's just line up someone on that side as well. We'll take about three or four more questions, folks, just in the interest of time. Oh, an American. Yes. Um, so I don't mean to be a buzzkill. Um, on the software side of the house, there's a lot of people globally that are qualified to do an analysis of software. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, how many of us are out there that can actually do the hardware? I, I, would, I would say probably less than 100 globally would actually be qualified to look at something like even the Novena um, and tell you that it's free and clear. Absolutely. I mean, so uh, I can't see you very well. Could you identify yourself? Uh, this is Josh, Josh Thomas. Great. Yeah, OK, great. So you're probably one of those 100 people, or you know someone who is. I mean, Charlie is one of those 100 people, right? And I think this, at the core, is the problem, which is that we should be able to trust our government institutions to do this job. And the NSA has subverted NIST, ISO, the IETF. Anywhere they put their hands, look to see what they are doing really, and probably they are not coddling, but strangling um, in secret. And so what we have to do is build capacity. That's an, exactly the problem. So to do that, we have to tear down the intellectual property regimes that make elitist knowledge a thing. We need to get rid of that. We need to open it up. Like, there was a hacking group here in Africa, which I've always wanted to meet, hack.co.za. Some of you probably have heard of it. Anybody? Their article about uh, attacking Volvos uh, is really fantastic. Uh, they were doing car hacking, you know, in the 80s um, by hitting the cars uh, with sledgehammers on the tires to open the doors. So early work. I hope you guys cite that in your car attack papers. Um, but they work to democratically change the way that knowledge is viewed. And that's part of what we have to do, right? The intellectual property regime creates paywalls around academic journals for everything from water filters to AIDS medication to things like this. And we have to change that. We have to build up capacity. We need to be able to have a CERT team that isn't actually just a front for giving the NSA bugs. And we have to rebuild trust at the core in our institutions. We don't need to tear down every single institution. We need to believe the institution actually will do what it says it does. And that, I think, we need more Mark Dowds of the world working on free software. We need more Charlie Millers doing that in the open, working on these things. And I'm like, I'm always happy when I see people like Charlie go from the NSA to Twitter, for example, 
right? Because that, that is the change we need to see. There are a lot of people that really understand these problems, and I hope that they will continue to leave and work in service of humanity instead of specific military goals. And that requires building capacity. So come work with us on free software. Please, we could really use your help, especially on the Tor browser, Charlie. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Anybody want to buy my used Volvo? Uh, I, do, do you know about this article? I'm from well Hacker? aware of it. Yeah. Anybody on that so, side? Gentleman over there, got the mic. Off you go. Hi. Um, I, re I read an article recently um, about the CIA confirming that they do drone strikes based on metadata alone. Yep. Do you think that is justified? Is it possible to, to justify doing so based on metadata? Well, you know, um, when we talk about, I mean, this is kind of getting off into the realm of deep, like, personal conviction, and I'm happy to say that. I mean, but I think let's talk about what this means first, and then I'll tell you how I feel about it. What he's saying is a very important story that was broken by Jeremy Scahill and Glenn Greenwald, wherein the NSA has a slogan internally, which is, we track them, you whack them. And what they do is they look for metadata. So let's say that you're the target. You're the target for whatever reason. They watch your phone, they watch where your phone goes, they see your behavioral patterns, they see who you call, they know that a meeting is going to happen. Now, they don't know that the meeting is a wedding because they're missing the context. And then you go to the wedding, they pass the information off to the CIA, and the CIA flies a robot over, let's say, Yemen, where we're not at war, or Pakistan, where we're not at war, and they uh, drone it, and they kill hundreds of people, for example. Um, there are two problems. The first problem is you don't know who is carrying that cell phone. And the second problem is that suspicion is not the same as confirmed guilt. And so without even addressing the bigger picture, I would just say, obviously, that that is morally wrong, because it is clear that it is not going to result in a just outcome where you were sure that even if it was the target, that that was the right thing to do. And I, I, I have very strong feelings about a lot of the details involved, but the point is that many times what we have heard about is that that metadata is wrong, and that they do attack, for example, a wedding party, or American children, like an American child in Yemen who is 16 and killed by a drone, or his father, who, in trying to kill this guy for a very long time, they actually killed a lot of other people along the way, just shooting <laughs> missiles at him. And so those methods don't really make sense to me because they seem to have what the military would call a lot of collateral damage. But it's actually by design, and the reason is because these people are considered to be subhuman merely by being suspected. And I don't believe that the narrative of terrorism is a justifiable one. And we need to deconstruct the notion of terrorism. Mandela himself was a terrorist for a long time in a lot of the West's eyes. And to me, that is the proof that the narrative about terrorism is bullshit, because it is about political struggle in that case. And whether or not we care about Mandela, for example, I do personally think that that's a really interesting story. I don't want to live in a world where we can't have a Mandela emerge without fear of a drone strike. I want a world where you can actually have a normal life and not be worried about, on a daily basis, being assassinated. And there are many people in many countries around the world where they, frankly, they have that fear. And you see it in the population of Pakistani children, of Yemeni children. You see it, and you'll see it in a lot more places. This will only get worse over time if we don't work to stop it, because at the core, it is unjust. Um, organizers, how are we doing for time here? Um, are, we, are we good? No more? That's it. We need to, uh, we need to, we need to move on. Jacob, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, we flew uh, <laughs> we flew 18 hours on your behalf and uh, endured a conversation with you.